Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. Most of us have had a vague sense that something's missing, and that longing for something better is a sign of being fully human. When you identify and carefully examine the things you long for, things like love, meaning, freedom, happiness, and growth, you not only discover deep truths about yourself, but you also find that the things you long for were never really missing at all. Our guest today points out how our longings actually point to the presence of something transcendent within us. Our guest is David Rico, author of the new book, The Five Longings, What We've Always Wanted and Already Have. Dave is a teacher, workshop leader, and psychotherapist in Santa Barbara and San Francisco. He combines Jungian, transpersonal, and mythic perspectives in his work. He is the author of numerous psychology self-help bestsellers, including How to Be an Adult in Relationships, The Five Things We Cannot Change, and When the Past is Present, a fascinating look at the psychological phenomenon of transference, which we interviewed him about on Pathways in 2013, and by the way, which is still in the archives at divination.com, where you can listen to any one of the last 300 Pathways interviews anytime you want. Well, hello, Dave, and welcome back to the Pathways show. Hi, Paul. Thanks for inviting me. Now, in your book, you, you start out by making the point that it is our nature to be seeking what we are. Now, that seems a little ironic. What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? First, I mean that there's an evolutionary drive in us to find out and then to express who we really are once we have cleared away all the messages from our parents, from the church, from society that try to tell us who we are. Right. Something in us that wants to unfold as we really are. And the pathway into that unfolding is our own longings. What we most deeply yearn for gives us a clue about who we really are. Okay, now, as you point out in the book, which was kind of frustrating, uh, at least for me, because I've always considered longing to be a problem. You know, Longing is kind of the second word in the phrase, unrequited longing. And I, I never thought of that as a, a positive thing. But, uh, and you, you quite openly um, admit that longings can be defined as strong and lasting yearnings for that which is not ultimately fully attainable. Why is it a good thing to desire something that's not attainable? It's, it's a matter of recognizing this evolutionary drive that I mentioned. This oak tree outside my window, which is about 80 years old, is completely itself in every moment. But at the same time, it is microscopically adjusting itself to the changing conditions that keep occurring in the environment. So in one sense, it's completely what it is, an oak tree, but in another sense, it's continually evolving and changing with every passing day. And there's no final version of what it's really about. Okay. So there's something in us that's like that. I so see. I am David, born in New Haven, Connecticut. And at the same time, I don't know fully who this David will turn out to be because he won't turn out to be some final product of what David is supposed to be like. When death comes, it'll simply interrupt the process by which I keep evolving. 
So evolutionary evolution doesn't have a final end point, and neither do our longings. Would you say that longing that is means, a? That's why our longings help us know ourselves, because we're more like longings in our deepest reality than we are like our desires. So if I could distinguish between a desire and a longing, maybe that would help. Sure. A desire is for something that's fully and finally attainable. We may not attain it, but it is attainable. For instance, you could have a desire for a healthy relationship. You could have a desire for a Maserati. You could have a desire for an ice cream cone. Well, you can fulfill the desire for the ice cream cone fully and finally. You can fulfill des the desire for the car if you can afford it. And you can fulfill the desire for the relationship if you find someone who can step up to the plate in the healthy way that you have in mind. But that's different from a longing. In a longing, your yearning is for something that even when it's fulfilled, you will still want more. So for instance, once you have the car, you're all set, you now have a car. But once you have love in your life, it's not finalized, you still want more love. That's completely healthy and no problem there. That's understandable if our very nature is to receive as much love as we can and to give as much love as we can, then it stands to reason that there will never be an end point to it, just like an evolution. So this is why a longing reveals you to yourself at a, diff at a different and deeper level than any of your desires could ever reveal yourself. So I, I, I take it then that longing could be considered a function of evolution. Totally. Mm -hmm. That's, there would be no that, longings if, if we weren't evolutionary. Right, and evolution is all about change, which brings up another paradox that you wrote in the book. We move towards fulfillment of our longings when we say yes to the impermanence of any satisfaction. Yeah, when you notice that this love that I'm feeling right now from this person has a certain wonderful feeling, but I can't expect that I'll feel this 24 <clears> seven. <throat> I can believe that my mother will continue to love me all my life, but I can't be sure that I will always feel that love. Yeah, you know, especially not in the way I'm feeling it in this moment. You know, as as you also say in the book, it's easy to understand why humans are so enamored of the possibility of heaven, because we want a place where all longings are utterly, fully, and finally fulfilled. Yeah, that's that would be a good definition of heaven. Right. Well, I know. I'm trying to say that these the five longings that I chose to write about in the book. There's a chapter for each one. <clears throat> that you mentioned at the beginning, love, happiness, growth, meaning, and freedom, and the freedom to be yourself, um, that these are also inside of us already. So here we are longing for something that is actually already in us from the from our birth on. It was a birth. These are our five birth rights. We were, um, we came from love, we're here for love, we have the capacity to love in us, that's the equivalent of having love inside, while at the same time, we keep looking for it outside. And basically what we're doing in a longing is we're looking for the mirroring of the love that is in us as humans. Now, how did you choose the five uh, longings that you uh, uh, expound on in the book? First, I looked at my own longings, 
And then I talked to various friends about theirs. Then I took stock of the longings of my clients. And gradually I found five that we all had in common. Those are the five that I chose. Okay. And of course, each of these five is a category. So for instance, the longing for love is also the longing for companionship, for caring, for compassion, for um, togetherness, for belonging, for healthy attachment. So each, uh, I, as I point out in the book, each of these has, you know, another 10 longings in its train. <clears throat> but the overall category, the overall categories are those five. And I love the way that you break down the longing for love uh, by bringing up the five A's. I'm not sure if you're the one who invented the five A's. I know I read it in one of your other books, and I love the way that it breaks down what love is. Did you did you come up with the five A's? Yes, that's in my book, uh, the How to Be an Adult in Relationships. I was thinking that when we look back into our early life, we notice that we had many needs, too many to enumerate or, or even name, but there are five needs that all of us always had and still have all through life. We have a need for a certain focused attention that would come from others toward us when they look into our yearnings and our needs and our beliefs and thoughts. We want someone who will pay attention. And we needed that from our parents at the beginning of life pay attention to when we were crying and needing the bottle, for instance. And we have that same need in adult relationships. We want to be heard. We want to be listened to, taken seriously. Right. So attention but is the first one. Also, we want to be accepted. So that's the second A. We want to be appreciated. We want to be held affectionately. That's physical holding. And finally, we want to be allowed to go when the time comes for us to go. We want someone to be able to let go of us rather than cling to us. And now, that would be for both of our parents and our partners. Mm -hmm. So when those five A's are in place, that's the equivalent of being loved. And when both people are giving those five A's to one another, that's the equivalent of intimacy. Right. I now you say that we can only find some fulfillment of the five A's from a partner, not total fulfillment. Why do you say that? Because that would be too much to ask from one person. So we're meant to, just as we were meant to be brought up by a village rather than have all our needs met by those two little people, mother and father. Mm -hmm. Likewise, all through life, we're surrounded by a possible support system if we are willing to take advantage of it and if it's there for us. We have family, friends, we have people at work, we have ourselves that we can turn to, take advantage of our inner resources. We have our spiritual connection to nature. So these are all other sources of getting those five A's. And my belief is we should never ask our partner for more than, say, 25% of the need fulfillment. We should have a nice big support system around us that we can turn to to share the need for attention, acceptance, appreciation, affection, and allowing. I wonder to what extent the lack of this kind of community of support contributes to the high divorce rate that we have because people may be expecting way too much of a partner. Yes, I agree. I believe that all expectations are invalid. Only agreements are valid, and even agreements may not always be kept. So when you accept the given, 
that not everyone gives you a fair deal or a generous deal. You're, you tend to be more forgiving of others because you realize that, you know, we humans are limited in how consistent we are. We have the capacity to keep agreements. We have the capacity to love. We have the capacity to pay attention, to accept others and so forth. But we can't be relied upon to provide them 24-7. Right. You know, you point out that when we are getting our five A's from a partner, we can feel an inflow of oxytocin, the hormone of relatedness, mm -hmm. which brings up the subject of hormones. And I'm wondering, uh, how do hormones impact longing and craving? The craving has more to do with the adrenaline and cortisol um, in our bodies that you know, uh, brings about a lot of stress. Whereas a longing can be held more lightly, it's a lifetime experience of, um, of some type of uh, yearning for what takes us beyond what any of our desires could ever fulfill. So for instance, Let's say you have a desire for a relationship. Well, that's truly a desire because it's something that is attainable. You may not attain it, but it certainly is attainable. But underneath the desire for the uh, relationship is a much deeper longing that will never be fulfilled fully. That longing is for the five A's that the partner will hopefully provide. And there it's very dicey because now your fate is in the hands of someone else. And you're asking for something that, as I said before, humans are not famous for fulfilling in any consistent way. Although, they fill it here or there, but you can't expect them to be there for you whenever you're in need. Unless you're an infant, right? Yeah, when you're an infant, it's obviously totally legitimate to expect 100% attention. Right. They, even if at three in the morning you scream for the bottle, they, they, the parents, are supposed to get up and take care of you. And that's perfectly legitimate because we're born in such a helpless state. So and as you grow and have your own resources, uh, you no longer can expect people to be at your beck and call. Yeah, that's too bad, isn't it? <laughs> so how do our longings sometimes reveal our fears? Well, my belief is, uh, and this, of course, is very ironic. Here we are longing for freedom, happiness, growth meaning, and love. But at another level, we're afraid of every single one of them. Let's take the freedom to be yourself, to show yourself as you really are, to let people see exactly what your deepest needs and wishes really are, who you are when you have no inhibitions left, who you are when you're letting everything hang out, even your dark side. Well, most of us are terrified to present ourselves that way. So we invent a persona that has very clear boundaries, that shows us to the world in the most flattering way you can possibly imagine. And uh, we give people the impression that that's who we are. Right. So, and that, and this follows with all the longings. I mean, the longing for love is full of fear. Some people fear that if I love, I will have to be too vulnerable, and I can't trust anybody with my vulnerable little heart. Others fear that if I love, I'll get so attached that if the other person leaves me, 
I'll fall apart and I will die from the sense of abandonment that will result. Other people fear closeness. If I let somebody get close, he or she will, will, um, will completely engulf me, smother me. So there are all kinds of fears. I talk about this in my other book, When Love Meets Fear. And the title says it all. It's rare that somebody just has pure love. I know the Bible says true love casts out fear, and I do believe that. But I think it happens only in moments. Most of the time, um, we feel fear and love at the same time. So this is true of all the longings. Right. And it's so ironic because here we are longing, saying that we long for something and we've always wanted it and we're out in the world looking for it and even believe that it's already in us anyway, in our pure Buddha nature, where we are perfect love, perfect freedom, perfect happiness, etc. And at the same time, there's something in us that is too timorous to go for it fully. Right. How, does, how, how can past trauma influence our current longings? Well, if the love experience was somehow associated with abuse of some kind, uh, some kind of trauma, trauma is the Greek word for wound, some way in which we were wounded, for instance, in our trust, like we, the trust was broken between us and one of our parents because of how they neglected us, misused us. Then uh, that longing for love will have difficulty coming out in a pure, direct way because there are so many trust issues that are uh, chaining us to the past. Right. And what do you hope that people will take away from the book, a book on longing? What, what, what's going to be the, the benefit to the reader, or what's the hope for benefit? My most hope for benefit is that a person would recognize that these beautiful longings make up his inner life and that is completely legitimate to want more love, more happiness and so forth, not more in the addictive way in which uh, the, a person might say, I want more drugs. It's not that kind of more. It's not more in the sense of, of uh, how much. It's more in the sense of how deep the longing show the depth in us. That depth in us is the equivalence of our Buddha nature, where we are fully enlightened, where we hold these longings not as desires that possess us and lead us to become attached, which is the recipe for suffering, but as uh, beautiful evolutionary yearnings to make ourselves and the world bigger and better. Okay, so the more we understand ourselves <clears throat> and can appreciate the depths that are in us, the happier and more um, efficacious we're going to be in our life in terms of of personal joy in terms of enlightenment, etc. Is that is that a good way of putting it? Yes, I think that's a very good way of putting it. Would I be able to read my? Uh, do we have time for me to read my affirmation? Um, this is the one that's in the book and that I start my day with. Yes, please. We've got about thirty seconds. Okay, I say yes to everything that happens to me today as an opportunity to give and receive love without reserve. So for instance, taking that as saying that everything that comes our way is a synchronicity because it presents us an opportunity to give and receive love 
that's the equivalent of everything that happens contributes to the fulfillment in, in whatever partial way is possible on a day-to-day basis of our longing. That's, that's beautiful. You know, I actually have that affirmation posted up on my bulletin board right in front of me right now, which I got from you a couple of years ago, and I want to thank you for that. And I want to thank you for being on the show again today. I mean, there's so much more we could explore about such a deep topic, but we've, we've basically run out of time. And uh, before we go, I want to tell our listeners about your website, which is DaveRico.com. That's D-A-V-E-R-I-C-H-O.com. And all of your books and your work um, are on that site. So thanks again, Dave, for being on the show. Thank you for inviting me. And for those who tuned in late, this is your Pathways host, Paul O'Brien, author of Great Decisions, Perfect Timing, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. In a second, I'll tell you how you can rewind and replay this interview anytime you like via the Internet or as a free podcast. Just search for Pathways or Paul O'Brien on iTunes uh, or your podcast server and you will find it. Today, we have been visiting with David Rico, author of The Five Longings what we've always wanted and already have. I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into the Pathways program, which is broadcast and streamed worldwide via KBOO.FM Sunday mornings at 8.30 a.m. USA Pacific Time. Podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at Divination.com. That's spelled D-I-V-I Nation.com, as well as via iTunes and other podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to David Rico and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways experience.